Okay, and there it is. She is so fast. She beats us all the time. Kenny, hey, everybody. <laughs> this is Kenny and... Kenny Squared. With the sports on the Positive Tip Podcast. Hope you're having a great week. We're a day late, but it's my fault. I have no idea what happened to our recording yesterday. So, but we've got some stuff to talk about. Kenny, how you doing there in Cleveland? Cleveland's the center of some things still again. And, and so got to get right into it. Baker Mayfield finally traded. So one part of this saga is at least closed. So going to depend on you to give us what is the, what is the deal there? How are folks feeling? Uh, are they feeling like there's some closure here? Baker Mayfield, the Carolina, I thought he should have get more of a number five draft pick, although that's in the NFL, that's actually pretty good. Um, but what's the feeling like there in Cleveland? Well, it's, um, I'd say for the most part, most people have been kind of upset. Um, but more like a, we, we've loved and appreciated what you've done, Baker. Good luck in Carolina. Um, there has been a few people that have been like kind of good riddance. Like we didn't watch anyway. But like to me, that's not really fair. I think he did really yeah. well here. Yeah. Um, like when he came here the previous four years, the Browns won four games. So like he definitely has helped turn this franchise around. Um, it kind of stinks cause he, he was doing so well and there's a lot of, like there was a lot of issues last year. It seems kind of bizarre that his teammates didn't really stick up for him. Um, but I hope he does well in Carolina. Um, the ironic part is that he's going to be playing the Browns week one. Um, and the Browns are going to be playing the Panthers to have him play them. So that's you, you got to move that into a nationally televised 430 game. I don't know what the other matchups are on, on week one. Uh, the NFL probably already has that. Uh, so, you know, obviously you're going to have the Thursday night opener and then you've got Sunday, then you've got, you know, probably a doublehead of Monday night. So there's probably some big games scattered, but I, I'm wondering, I, I, you know, can they bump uh, a, a game there at 430 and put that as the, as the national game? That is amazing how that's sewed. And, and so I, and you're probably looking at the schedule knowing you. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I, I want to ask you, what do you think? Baker Baker's reaction is going to be um, um towards towards the, towards Browns. the Browns yeah oh he's gonna he's not exactly a guy that's shy about um, no. rubbing things in so he's definitely gonna rub some stuff in yeah um, anytime there's a touchdown it's gonna be a huge celebration um so I don't know it's I do feel bad for him because like the Browns really kind of were they tried to shoot their shot with someone that was better than him. And it seems to have bite them in the butt a little bit. We'll see kind of long-term how that's going to look, but yeah, yeah, I don't know. It's going to be interesting. Um, I'm going to read you off these, uh, these four o'clock games. Yeah. 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 And I wholeheartedly agree. You should bump one of them because none of them are that good. Um, oh, wow. Yep. You, you have the giants and Titans. So that's okay. going to be the one that you get to see. Good luck with that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the Chiefs and the Cardinals. That's that's pretty intriguing. That's probably the national game, but go ahead. Um, that one's on CBS. So uh yeah. Raiders Chargers. Okay. Once again, that's that's interesting. Not that interesting. Yeah, yeah. And then the Packers and the Vikings. Okay. Um, and that's CBS too, right? Oh, Fox. That's a Fox. That's game. a Fox one. Fox. So Foxes, Giants, Titans, Packers, Vikings. Um, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Packers, Vikings in New York, uh, for sure. And so yeah. uh, if you look up at um, at 1 o'clock, what network is, because that's an interconference game, right? So what network is uh, Browns? Browns uh, and that's Browns. a CBS. The CBS game. So, so if you put that, yeah, yeah, if you put yeah. that at 4.30, you would bump probably Cardinals, Cardinals, Chiefs, uh, they're not going to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, because um, you have Kyler Murray and there's so many storylines with him uh, and you've got obviously Patrick Mahomes and it's going to be so many storylines around the Chiefs. Can they, you know, get back to uh, the Super Bowl this year? So they're, 
they're not going to bump that game, but that'll be a highly rated one o'clock game for sure. Yeah. Well, and, and even when it comes to revenge games, it's not the best revenge game of the week. Um, Monday night football is Broncos at Seattle. Um, so oh, Russell man. Wilson's heading back to Seattle. Wow. How did that how work out? Wow. That's even, that's just as good. Although Russell Wilson wasn't bitter, you know, like uh, Baker is. Um, let me ask you this now. It, I, I, Watson things still go, although they said the hearings are done. Is there any chance that he plays this year from your point of view? Um, I would say no if the NFL wants to have pretty decent um, PR. Um, I think that I think that if they decide to suspend him, because I've heard that there was a chance of doing like a six to eight week suspension um, with no appeal. Um, but like if they do that, it's going to look really bad, especially yeah. when you compare to Trevor Bauer, when you compare to some of the other things that say baseball is done or also just this whole thing with Deshaun Watson. I mean, 24 lawsuits, but then also he's had 66 different massage therapists over 17 months. It's not going to look good if he has a short suspension. Yeah. And um, the only thing is if he does get suspended for a year, he has every right to appeal. And then the appeal process could take just as long. Um, I remember that was one of the things with Tom Brady with the whole deflate gate thing. The, um, the appeal was going to go into the season and he's like, I don't want to have to deal with um, dealing with it. Like, while I'm trying to play football. So whatever, I'll just take the suspension. That's interesting. So, so that's interesting. That means that he would play during the appeal process. Yeah. Wow, Which also wouldn't be good. No, I, I forgot about that. Brady missed like four games in like the middle of the season. If I remember for that deflate gate thing. Right. Um, I, I'm, yeah, I'm no, he, um, yeah. he missed the, the first four games of the year. Oh, he missed the first four games. Okay. okay. Yeah. Cause he, he didn't want it to linger on. So he was like, whatever, I'll just. So he could have played uh, and while it yeah. was appealing, but he chose, Hey, let me get the first four games out of the way. Okay. Um, wow. That will be really interesting to see fan reaction and stuff like that. Um, I, I can't see him winning an appeal. Maybe he gets it reduced a little bit. I just, I, you know, but so the Browns, though, I would guess are more than prepared to ride with Jacoby Brissett, very, very competent, capable backup quarterback that can step in and at least, you know, hold down, you know, the fort. And I think for him, this will be a big, big test, right, to prove that he could be a starter in the NFL somewhere. It probably won't be long term in Cleveland, is my guess. If if you know, eventually Watson is going to play, I would think. Um, what's the fans feeling like now that Baker is definitely gone? That they're going to be riding with Jacoby more than likely. Um, I think it was one of those like you kind of held out a little bit of hope that you would have Baker, like maybe things would get better. But it's like, okay, well, I guess this is what we're stuck with now. So we'll see how it goes. Yeah. Um. But I think, like, especially if they can, which they should have been doing last year anyway, if they can rely more on the running game. I mean, you got probably the best running back tandem in all football between Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt. Like, if you can ride that out a little bit and then you have a great defense, you have a good offensive line, I think they should be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Are they winning a Super Bowl with Jacoby Brissett? Probably not. But – I think they can make the playoffs. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh there's no doubt. No doubt. Uh, I imagine if he takes him to the Super Bowl, though. <laughs> oh, man, you're like Nick Foles, right? Right off into the sunset yeah. after that. that. That's amazing. Well, listen, at least part of this chapter is closed. And uh, I, I, I guess, you, you know, I'm still surprised they didn't probably ask for Sam Donald back. And now Donald and uh, Baker on the same – on the same team and you had an interesting thought about that yeah um now the panthers have the number one and number two overall draft picks of the same draft and they didn't draft either of them yes amazing that's really amazing and sam donald was such a class guy i you know you, i i just want to see him do well 
And but the fact that they went out and got another a, a starting quarterback who is certainly has is more accomplished in these first four or five years, whatever it is that they've been in the league in Baker Mayfield, that speaks kind of volumes where they probably want Donald to be, which will be probably the backup, you know, there. And maybe that's his role in the NFL for the next 10 years. That's, you know, that's not a bad role at all. Uh, but man, oh man, coming out of USC, you figured he was the next guy, you know, um, but it just hasn't worked out for him and maybe it still will. Um, so interesting, interesting. Let's shift gears because we got to take some time here to talk about the Brooklyn Nets and just the hot mess that they are right now. So Kevin Durant after Kyrie opts in, which is odd to me. I, I, I you know. I want to ask you that first. And then, you know, Kevin Durant, go, go straight to the owner, which I think is also a little bit unusual, right? Didn't go to the GM. Uh, he goes right above his head, goes straight to the owner, requests a trade, and it hasn't leaked out as to why, you know, why he's requested a trade, especially after Kyrie said he was coming back, which you figure that's what he wanted. Your opinion, why do you think Durant requested a trade? Um, truth be told, I don't get it. Um, yeah. cause like when you look at what he has in Brooklyn, he really should have everything he wants. Um, the two of them have kind of basically been running the organization. They picked the head coach. They were able to bring James Harden in. Like there isn't really that much more that you could ask for. And really anywhere he would go, he's not going to be the guy kind of similar to when he was in Golden State. Like, if, say, he were to go to Phoenix, that's still going to be a Devin Booker, Chris Paul-led team. Um, if you were to go to Miami, still would be, like, a Jimmy Butler type of team. Um, so, like, I don't know if maybe he just – he feels like it's just too toxic in Brooklyn. Um, maybe it's the – I've heard some people kind of mentioning maybe it's the way they treated Kyrie. But also, like – Kyrie hasn't been really around that much. So I don't blame them for that. Um, But it will be interesting to see how this ends up because, um, I mean, when you really think about it, have you ever seen a star of Kevin Durant's caliber ask for a trade, especially like with as much time left on his contract as he had? I'm even thinking in any sport. Like, no, no. The haul (laughs) for him will be crazy. Um, Yeah something I had seen yesterday. Um, apparently the Timberwolves went out and asked for like a proposal. The Nets asked for Anthony Edwards, Carl Anthony Towns, and four first round picks. Um, so I don't, I don't think they're going to trade him because they're asking for a ton and rightfully so. I mean, Rudy Gobert got eight players for him so just crazy yeah that's great a very very good player Rudy Gobert but so certainly not Kevin Durant I, I saw that same article right and and you got Edwards and Towns who are I think Towns is already a star Edwards is a definitely budding star probably taking that next step this year now you got Gobert on that team uh, let's go you know Minnesota is putting together a really really solid young team that's probably going to be good for a long time. And, and this is, um, I think this is the uh, trouble when you, when you break up a team for one person, because while Minnesota gave a lot, it was mostly role players. You know, Patrick Beverly is very good, but it was mostly role players, but it was a lot of draft picks, right? Which is in the NBA and NFL, those are big, big deals, right? But let's just say play out here for a second, Phoenix. First of all, they're not going to – the Phoenix, I I don't see in any circumstances trading Devin Booker. He's like, even though Chris Paul is there, Booker kind of came up with that franchise. He's the face of that franchise. He's an outstanding player. I, I, I can't see them even if they said straight up Devin Booker for Kevin Durant. No knock on Durant. I just don't think Phoenix would do that. Why would they? And, and then I start to think about this. Why would Phoenix break that team up? Cause they'd have to give three or four really good players and some draft picks to get Durant. Right. And, and why would they do that? Um, now the windows closing a little bit with Chris Paul, right? Because he's up there in age, but he still played at a very high level last year. Um, so I'll put Phoenix to the side for a second. Miami is another team that he said he'd be interested in going to. Why would they break up their team? 
they went to game seven of the conference finals this past year. Is Kevin Durant going to get them over the hump? Well, it just depends on who you have to give up for him. And you'd have to give up a lot of these guys. They, they probably start with Tyler Hero and let's work from there. Uh, and uh, Bam, you know, both those guys would, would definitely have to go uh, if, you, if you're talking about Durant. And, and again, and I don't think Miami has a bunch of draft picks because um, they've gone all in with a couple of trades. And Miami's team is still relatively young. You know, Jimmy Butler's still not an old guy. You know, and they they can, aside from Kyle Lowry, they can contend for a long time, you know, going forward. They're still a Hall of Fame coach. So why would they do that? And, and and so you start to then, you know, limits his options on where he can go um, if he wants to win a championship right away. Because the other side of that is if you got any one of those teams, is it going to be good enough, even with Durant, to, to go deep into the playoffs and win a championship? Um, I don't know. I mean, and so I told you this before, two things we know for sure about Kevin Durant. One is that he's one of the best players of all time. Two is that he's very thin-skinned. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering if the whole New York vibe and whole New York thing, you know, after three years here, four years here, um, has just gotten to him and he's like kind of done. And I get that, you know, um, I, I, I totally can understand that. The trouble is he's so thin skinned and against the media, he's not going to come out and say why he asked for a trade. I don't think we're yeah. going to find that out. Um, probably until after he's traded, maybe not even then, um, if he is traded. So we talked a little bit about that. What if the Nets say, you know what, we're not trading you. And Kyrie, we're not trading you either. We're rolling what we got here, um, which is not a bad team if you have a healthy Ben Simmons running that offense and you have a healthy Joe Harris coming back and you picked up a couple of good pieces as well. Um, and, you know, what, what if that scenario plays out? What are your thoughts there? Well, I can see that happening. Um because also another thing, uh, a couple other factors here. So I want to compare Kevin Durant here, not in talent wise, but to Carmelo Anthony. Yeah. When he came to our beloved Knicks, mm -hmm. the Knicks had something going, but they had to give up so many pieces to get him here. And as a result, like a lot of the role players that were doing so well, never really got a chance to like mm -hmm. form that cohesion. Yeah. Um, I think that would, that would be the case wherever he would go. Um, maybe with the exception of if he went to like a Golden State, because Golden State they figure out how to make players out of nothing anyway. So, yeah. um, if I were the Nets, I would say let's let's revisit this in January. Let's try this for a couple months. Right. We have a healthy Ben Simmons, Kyrie Irving still here. We don't have to worry about vaccination stuff, and see how it goes. Um, and if you're still unhappy in January, we can revisit it. Kevin Durant's there for four years. Um, he doesn't have a no trade clause, so he could literally be traded anywhere. Um, and a lot of people think that Kevin Durant wouldn't be the type of guy to hold out kind of like Ben Simmons where, or even like an Anthony Davis, where it doesn't seem like basketball is like the number one thing. Kevin Durant yeah. seems like the type of guy he just wants to ball out. Yeah. Um, another big factor too, is there are, here's a list of players that, they cannot trade for so long as Ben Simmons is on the roster. Um, a CBA thing says that you can't have two rookie max deals. And wow. since Ben Simmons is on a rookie max, here are the guys that they cannot trade for um, if Ben Simmons is on the roster. Bam Adebayo, Devin Booker, wow. Luka Doncic, Joel Embiid, Darren Fox, SGA, Donovan Mitchell, Jamal Murray, Michael Porter Jr., Jason Tatum, Carl Anthony Towns, Andrew Wiggins, and Trey Young. Now, obviously, you can move Ben Simmons, so um, so you probably have to have a third team in there. But it does make things also a little more complicated for the Nets because, like, you look at all those guys, you'd be like, well, I would take any of those guys. Like, if I'm Phoenix or if I'm trying to trade with Phoenix, the first guy I'm looking at is Devin Booker. Like, yeah. if he's not in the trade, yeah. I'm not looking for it. Right. So um, I think that's what also can make it a little bit more complicated. But once again, you can you can always add like a third team. But also, who's going to want Ben Simmons right now? 
he doesn't exactly have the highest of trade value. So yeah. nobody's seen him play for over a yeah. year now. Yeah. Um, that, that starts to limit the options though. And when you start to add the third and even sometimes these NBA trades, you add a fourth team, it, it, even James I'm Harden. Yeah. I, I, I'm just wondering how anxious any of these teams will be to help the Nets out, you know, um, uh, and, and see, I think the only, the only chance you're taking with Kevin Durant is, is, is his health, right? Because I do think he, if he's healthy, he can still play at a high level for three or four more years, in my opinion, right? Based on what you see. I mean, he seems to stay in great shape. He seems to always be sharp. Like you said, he's, he loves the game. Um, on the other hand, would you now take a chance on, on Kyrie Irving as well? And that one gets a little bit more trickier because of the last few years, you know, and, and not even that you go back further. The couple of years with the Celtics was an absolute disaster. And I never understood that from our our buddy Dave Ruff's point of view. I was like, why did you guys like Kyrie? He's like, just watch. <laughs> and he was right. You know, he said, just watch in Brooklyn. Watch how there's going to be times he just doesn't show up. And sure enough, that happened. And and so, but he'll probably be motivated to have a spectacular year this year, right? And to probably play in as many games as, as he can play. And he's had the injury bug as well. You know, you can't really gauge that with some players. Some players just get hurt quicker than others. Who knows? Um, but I think it's all the other stuff. You know, is he really toxic? I don't know. You know, I think NBA players know that. And, um, you know, like I, I never thought for a second, I'll get your opinion here and then we can, we can move on to the high flying Yankees um, with a, another great win last night. But um, I never thought that LeBron would take him back there in LA or, or they would reteam with the Lakers. I mean, it still might happen. I could still be totally wrong. But he he stands for almost everything the opposite of what LeBron stands for, you know. Um, and and I, I really don't want to put Kyrie down here. And our podcast is built around positivity, right? Because I've you've heard me defend Kyrie a lot over the last last couple of years because I do think he will eventually be a philanthropist. I think he will eventually maybe even run for public office, stuff like that. I think his intentions are good. But some of the things I saw this past year, especially in that Celtic series, was just awful. I was really surprised, actually. But I think that LeBron shows up every day. LeBron plays really hard. LeBron has the heart of a champion. He doesn't let the other stuff get into it. Like, you never saw. How long has LeBron been playing now? 18 years? 17, 18 years? Has there been one yeah, time? I think 20 years. Just, this is 20, 20 years. Season. Has there been one time in his long, illustrious career that he just didn't show up, right? And he just was like, yeah, I just don't feel like playing today. Or he winds up at a party or something like that. I mean, you know, as much as some people put LeBron down, he really represents the good in the NBA, in my opinion. Because, I mean, has this guy ever been in trouble? Has he? And he shows up to play every single night, unless he's just hurt, which he has been. You know, he didn't, uh, you know, this... uh, the whole load management stuff, which, you know, kind of started with Tim Duncan and a few of those guys in San Antonio. LeBron did it once or twice. And remember, he came out and said, that just doesn't feel right, especially if I'm on the road and fans pay, you know, to come see the Cavaliers or the Lakers because I'm on the team. He said, I got to show up. You know, I can't just be sitting on the sideline if I'm not hurt. And, And Kyrie hasn't done that in now the last six years. You know, so that's kind of a long track record and, and how he put LeBron down kind of when he left Cleveland, you know, I'm not sure LeBron forgot all that, you know, so unless LeBron just wants to squeeze in one more title, you know, before, uh, you know, before he retires, uh, you know, maybe because I mean, they would be formidable, a, a healthy Kyrie who's motivated and comes to play every night teams with a still at just a high level playing LeBron. That's a great start. Who you had to give up for him? Who knows? You know, Westbrook and whoever, you know. But anyway, what's your opinion on that? Yeah, it is interesting um, because Kyrie has also made it very well known that he wants to be with the Lakers. Also, nobody else wants Kyrie right now. Um, <laughs> I, you know. <laughs> and I don't blame them because, like, you don't know what you're going to get. 
but the Lakers also are desperate because they have the horrible $47 million contract in Russell Westbrook. And you don't know if Anthony Davis is going to be healthy. I don't know if you saw this. This was a couple weeks ago. Um, so it was just kind of casually talking to Anthony Davis. It's like, yeah, I haven't picked up a basketball in months. <laughs> Which, like, you know when LeBron saw that, he was probably furious. Yeah. Um, and, uh-huh. and so, like, yeah, the Lakers aren't in a great situation. The other thing, too, the Lakers don't have their own draft pick until 2027. And, so, like, and, you know. They're in a tough like spot. the guy that they're going to draft is in like yeah. seventh grade now. So they're... like, <laughs> so like, it's just, they're in a bad spot. So yeah. I can yeah. see them really wanting to get Kyrie. It's just, uh, we need it. We need something to shake things up. Yeah. They're, they're in an awful position right now. Uh, the Lakers. And, and I think just like the Nets, the teams around the league ain't going to do them any favors. You know, yeah. uh, they ain't gonna do them any favors. I'm sure that you know they made a phone call. I said, "Hey, we'll trade Westbrook straight up for Kyrie." Polly Sean Marks was like, "No, are you nuts! I'm not taking 47 million dollars because you and it cost him at least 20 million to buy him out. You know, and let him go. I would think, you know, and if I'm Westbrook, I'm like, yeah, I don't want to buy out. You know, forget it. I mean, that's up to the player. You know, so." Yeah. All right, let's switch. Again. We got to watch this. I, well, but I do think, um, and, and I don't know if you agree with this or not, I think this is going to linger through the summer. And it might linger oh, yeah. to January, like you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right, you're Yankees. So big four game se- What? <laughs> I don't know. Should I say it's a big four game series? I mean, it's still, yeah, 13 game lead or so um, against the Red now. Sox. 14 now. <laughs> wow. Um, and, and so... First half is 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 kind of in the books, right? Uh, the Mets with a big win last night, and we can talk about the Mets in a second. Looking forward to next week. I'm glad they're not looking past the Marlins. But looking forward to next week, big uh, series with the Braves, and they got a lot of games left with the Braves. But your Yankees, oh my gosh! So six to five last night. Um, I, I, I don't know, man. Uh, it, this is just shaping up to be just one of these really really special seasons. So what would you grade the Yankees for the first half? I'd, I'd waffled on this a little bit, but I'm just going to go with an A+. Plus. I, I thought about saying A because they hadn't won the World Series, but um, there really isn't anything much to complain about this year. Um, Aaron Judge, who hit his 30th home run a couple nights ago, um, is on pace for about 60 home runs. We haven't seen that in a hot second. Yeah. Um, yeah. We like you look at all the guys in the lineup. Glaber Torres has improved a lot. DJ LeMahieu has been pretty good. Anthony Rizzo has been great. He's on pace for 45 home runs. His career high is 32. Wow. Um, Stanton will probably be an all star is my guess. Right now, he's one of the leaders in the voting, which ends, I believe, today. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you can't uh, – Trevino's been excellent. The rotation has been spectacular. The bullpen's been pretty good, even though they've missed Luizaga for most of the year. Chapman's been out. Um, Chad Green also is not coming back till next year. So, like, you look at everything. Everything has been really good. Really, the only thing that you can complain about as a Yankee fan this year is probably the corner outfields. Um, Aaron Hicks has had his moments this year. But also for the most part, he's struggled. And Joey Gallo has been off. Um, yeah. I didn't even pull up what he did yesterday, but. Yeah. He's uh, just boy, been, bad, man. Yeah. He's one of those guys, like, it kind of is to me seeming more and more. He's like, you know, those guys that just, they can't play in New York. I think he's one of those guys. Yeah. Uh, he's 0 for 2 with two walks, but his batting average through the early part of July is 165. Yeah, um, his uh, OPS is 621. His career OPS is 804. Um, wow. In his last 15 games, um, he is two for 38. One of those two being a home run. He has 10 walks, but he has 21 strikeouts. His batting wow. average is 053. So, wow. What do you do, um, though? What do you do with, with Gallo? I don't know. My biggest concern is come the playoffs. I remember so many times they're like 
in September, but also in the wild card game. Aaron Judge was hitting well. John Carlos Stanton was hitting well. Gallo was hitting right in between them. And they would pitch around both of those guys to get to Gallo. And I, yeah. I hate to see him in a big spot, but also they have been batting him knife pretty consistently now. Um, to me, I don't know. Um, you trade him for somebody else, attach a prospect to him, um, to give teams an incentive. I don't know. Like you look at a, a team like say Oakland or like a team that's like really out of it. Maybe. Yeah. 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 I, it, it's almost reminding me of uh, two players. One, one with the Mets, Ike Davis, and then Ooh. remind me, remind me the player with the Orioles that signed him, Chris Davis, right? Yeah. That signed a big contract. And, and then he just totally lost it as well. And, you know, Gallo's had some really good years. And, and so it's surprising. And he's still pretty young. It's so surprising that he would just lose it like this. But I, I got to think, man, that they got him at the trade deadline last year, right? Yeah. So he's almost a year in. And I would think at even though New York is New York, right, with this team playing the way it is, I would think there's not a ton of pressure on him, right? I mean, so maybe it's New York. I don't know. Yeah, I mean – this team is on pace to win 116 games right now. Yeah. Like they're in spite of with that 165. Yeah. Yeah. So I wouldn't think that there's a lot of pressure. Um, to me, I would love for the Yankees to give Miguel and Duhar a little bit of a run. He came up yeah. as the yeah. 27th man um, over the weekend in Cleveland and he killed it. Yeah. Um, he can hit. Yeah. 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 He's not yeah. the best defender, but. Right. At least if you give him some reps out there, if you give him some time, he might actually become the hitter that he was in his rookie yeah. season. Yeah. But I don't know. It does seem like maybe Gallo just – and it might also just be like that I continue to get in my head. So I don't know. Um, but also, if that's the only thing you have to complain about, then well, <laughs> I guess you're in a good spot. It is. My next question for you, though, is you're Brian Cashman – training deadline coming up what are you looking for um i would say uh, a corner outfielder like a andrew benintendi type of guy right. um he's i've seen his name pop up a couple times and maybe another bullpen arm um yeah you are getting low eyes to get back probably after the all-star break chapman has had a couple of appearances we got to still see if he's fully back he goes through these phases anyway so it is what it is um you're not gonna have chad green back until next year maybe 2024 if that wow um but also zach Britton should be coming back whether late august early september i forgot about him so, gosh he hasn't been in a while right man yeah. yeah so hopefully he seems to be on track um his tommy john surgery was different um i had heard recently he um like they, I don't know, they did something different with it. Really? Okay. Um, okay. Which apparently will help kind of speed up the timeline. So yeah. I don't know. Um, I would say adding another bullpen arm doesn't hurt. And then um, you probably need another corner outfielder because um, you, can't, you can't have Gallo out there batting 165, oh. even though he's got good speed, even though he's – good defender yeah um i'd rather have like if we're gonna go with good speed and good defender i'd have tim lacastro out there yeah and i don't think sending him to the minors would would do any any good it might i don't i don't think so though um not a veteran like that geez um you know let me ask you this last thing on the yankees and we'll pivot over to the metro real quick cashman over the last i'd say four or five years uh, although he made some great moves last year. So let's take last year out of it. But but people have been surprised how quiet sometimes he is at the trade deadline. But obviously last year he got Rizzo and Gallo, if I remember right. Um, yeah. And maybe there was somebody else. But um, would you be shocked if, if he just did nothing at this trade deadline? Maybe a little bit. But okay. I feel like um, – because also right now the ALCS goes through Houston. Yeah. They've, they've wow. been there yeah. five years in a row now. 
Yeah. Um, I think a lot of it will depend on what they do. Um, because I don't think that the, like you're, you've won 60 games already and it's not even at the all-star break yet. Yeah. And like Cashman knows, like, this is the year you got to cash in the title. You got to do it. Right. You got to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think, especially if somebody comes available, they'll go a little bit harder at them. Um, yeah. But also there isn't a ton of gaps. But people will be mad if yeah. Joey Gallo is still throwing up uh, throwing up awful numbers in what, middle five, August. Like, yeah, I feel I feel so bad for him because uh, he seems like genuinely a good guy and he's had some success. So you know he can play. You know, I I gotta say he's probably hit thirty homers and he's not a big RBI guy. It seems like I don't think he ever has been, but you know he's he's put up some good numbers. I mean. I, I, it's it's just hard for me to believe with him it's New York because I just don't see that pre- if they were losing and he was you know batting 165 um boy oh boy the bluebirds would be raining down you know but I, oh yeah I, you know um what's what's his uh numbers with Texas look like I think you're looking at him well, let's see um uh, I'll give you a two-year stretch of 2017 yeah. 2018 yeah Never a big average guy, so that's not a big right. thing to me. Right, two oh nine. Right, but he had forty one home runs and eighty RBIs. Oh, well, I mean, you should have more than eighty RBIs with forty one home runs, but okay, we'll take it. Right. Um. Twenty eighteen, two oh six. So once right. again, not great. Um, but forty home runs and ninety two RBIs. Okay, that's um, that's a good year. Even last year. Bad 199, which is kind of funny. Um, but he hit 38 home runs and then 77 RBIs. Wow. But he also had 111 walks. See, that's which really, led the really league. good. Yeah. But also really struck good. out 213 times. Which oh my god. Also gosh. led the league. Stri- it, it used to be the cardinal sin in baseball to strike out 100 times, you know. Now it's like you have a lot of guys strike out 200 times or more. That's a lot of strikeouts, 213 times. Oh my gosh. Oh. Well, listen, he's uh, a, he, he's a go ahead. Um, I'll add this stat too. Um, Joey Gallo struck out, I think, 63 times over the last couple months. Tony Gwynn has struck out less over the last three years of his career, but <laughs> that's yeah, that's amazing. I mean, what happened to you know, just trying to get your bat on the ball there, but that's not his game. His game is just hitting home runs, and it seems like he hit a lot of solo home runs, you know, with uh, with with uh, you know, 41 homers and. 80 something RBI. I mean, that's, that's a lot of, you know, solo home runs, but uh, I'll still take it. I mean, you know, you, he ser- definitely serves a purpose, especially with the walks and especially that he's good, really good defensively. All right. I'm going to give the Mets an A for the first half. I think there's so many things to like about this team and it all starts and ends with Buck Walter. Uh, you know, that's not a second guess, right? I, I thought that that's what the Mets were missing. The leadership, uh, of a veteran, really good veteran manager. They haven't had that since Terry Collins left. And and Showalter, even I'll give Terry Collins a lot of props because he did get to the World Series, which I don't believe Showalter has yet in his career. But Showalter's overall, I think, track record a better manager than Terry Collins. And and don't I'm not knocking him. Terry Collins is a very good manager. But uh, he is a guy that he just knows how to push the right buttons. He relates well to the players. He knows when to stick up for his players. Uh, and and he, the way he uses his bench has just been spectacular. You know, what we're getting out of Luis Guillorme this year is just great. And you even see sometimes during the game, uh, Lindor, uh, guys like that are standing next to Buck, you know, and, and, and talking with him, strategy and stuff like that. The Mets just seem to be really in tune, you know, to what's going on on the field more than they were before, certainly under Mickey Calloway or Luis Rojas. And, and again, no knock on either one of those guys, uh, but I just never thought either one would be good managers or ready for a team that did have the talent. And listen, the talent that they brought in has done it, it extremely well. Uh, Marte has been the best out of uh, the guys that they brought in. Kenna has kind of hit a wall. He's, he's more kind of hitting to what his career numbers are, um, but he's a very good player, solid fundamentally. Escobar has struggled uh, most of the time at the at the bat, but he's had some clutch hits and he's played a spectacular, spectacular third base. Um, 
Lindor's average is concerning, but he's he's been showing the leadership that he brings, and he's got a lot of RBIs. I think he has 58 RBIs, um, which is a lot. He'll, he'll probably have over 100 at the end of the year. He has 13 home runs, 14 home runs maybe even. Um, and Alonzo's been great. Um, Jeff McNeil has been Jeff McNeil. You know, that uh, last year was definitely a blip, you know, on the radar for him. He should be an all-star. Uh, I think he's third in the league in batting. And uh, he's just a throwback player, you know, chokes up and, uh, you know, he gets his bat on the ball. He rarely strikes out. Uh, and Brandon Nimmo has been spectacular. You know, he's just having a great year. He probably won't be an all-star because I think he's batting like 278, somewhere around there right now. Um, there's been so many guys, you know, like I, I can't advocate even for, advocate even for Lindor to be an all-star, even though he has high RBIs. Now when you're batting like 240, 245, uh, uh, which I, I think is around what, what he's batting right now. Certainly Alonzo uh, should be an all-star McNeil. And then I got to say, Edwin Diaz, man, he has been just unbelievable. Uh, I don't know if you caught this. There was some things with um, the Mets and Reds throughout that series. You know, uh, the Mets, as always, were getting plunked left and right. <laughs> um, but none of them seemed really intentional, right, and, until – uh, Escobar looked like he was buzzed almost intentionally for whatever reason. And him and the pitcher exchanged some words. Uh, you know, a couple of players came out, you know, just, you know, they'll gather outside the dugout. No big deal. That was in the eighth inning. And sure enough, in the 10th inning, um, you know, first couple of pitches, Escobar to uh, Mustakas, who's a really big guy. He buzzed him, man, and threw inside, you know, not in his head, but, you know, threw inside twice. You could just tell the message was there and then he bore down after that and uh in in totally 13 pitches so you take out those first two pitches which were definitely intentional um 11 pitches he struck out the side you know with the runner on second there in the 10th inning and and so he's got and, and so the reason why I mentioned that though he's gotten past that hump of it wasn't a safe situation it was eight to three and he was warming up because it probably he thought it would be a safe situation and then Brandon Nemo hit a three-run homer so it wasn't a safe situation, but yet he still came in like it was. So I, I think, you know, he's got like a 1.89 ERA, probably went down. He didn't pitch last night, but I think it's a 1.89. He's got 18 saves out of 21. Uh, and, and he's just an exciting, exciting type of pitcher now. Uh, and he hasn't had those big meltdowns like he's had in the last few years. Even in three blown saves, it, it, I think one of them was a big home run, but he stayed away from that. His slider has been outstanding. So, so listen, I, I could go on and on. I'm really happy with the Mets. I, I think that uh, they're built for October this year. I think they'll get there, especially Scherzer looked fantastic. And now if you got DeGrom coming back, although we've got the black cloud looming, you know, more and more saying that DeGrom will opt out, you know, of his last year at the end of this year, I, I you know, I, I can't see that happening, but you know, strange that they have Freddie Freeman is a Dodger. You know, can Jacob DeGrom be a brave? I don't know. Uh, I hope not. Um, so, but but I think that it's going to be a big second half of them. But what's going to be exciting is that the Braves are, are a great team. World Series champions. They're hard charging. Um, I, I don't I don't know if they won last night. They were tied late and I went to bed. I know they tied one to one. Maybe you can look that up if they won last night too. But that yeah. would be a, they won last night. That's a four game sweep of the Cardinals. Oh my gosh. Uh, you know, they lost. And, Oh, they lost. Okay, the, yeah, the Braves they lost in the in eleven. In the eleven. Okay, I knew they were tied late, like in the ninth inning. They were tied one to one, um, but still three out of four from the Cardinals. I mean, they've just stayed hot for a long time now. So um, it's going to be a lot of fun, and, and it's going to be a great race. That rivalry, I think, is going to be back. They have a lot. They haven't played much. I think they've only played one or two series so far this year. So they've got a lot of games left in the second half, starting next week. Um, and that should be a lot of fun. We're going to get Mike on, uh, and we'll have him on on Thursday after the three game series, uh, because I never bet, but it, he said, Hey, uh, unequivocally, the Braves are going to sweep the Mets next week. I was like, no, they're not. And I'll buy you and your family dinner, you know, through DoorDash, um, if the Braves sweep the Mets next week. And so, um, he said, deal, I'm not getting anything. So, cause I didn't want anything, but, um, but I, I, I just like, I don't think the Mets will sweep the Braves. I, I really don't. I think these teams are going to battle. I think it'll be some one of these teams will obviously win two out of three. I don't think there'll be a sweep, um, you know, in all fairness. So anyway, let's pivot. You ready for your number three? 
best sports moment of all time. Uh, yep. I'll give you I'll give you mine, and then you can take yours and, and wrap us up. I, I'm gonna add in the backdrop of our nation being rocked. Obviously, understatement, right? But 9/11, and obviously it affected us in New York. Uh, it affected the whole country, but we felt it here in New York a little bit more than the rest of the country. And when sports came back, you know, baseball was was done for I, I think almost a week. And but when sports came back, it was such a, a relief, I think, for all of us. We wanted to kind of get away. And and I remember George Bush, you know, throwing out the first pitch at Yankee Stadium, you know, right after uh, or maybe it was the World Series. I could have that wrong. But yeah, but um, the first game back at Shea Stadium, Mets and Braves. And at this point, the Mets are they were still technically in it, but. Uh, the Braves had, had this thing wrapped up. The Mets really didn't have a good year that year. Uh, and, you know, they didn't follow up from, you know, the, the previous year. And, but Mike Piazza was clearly their star. And the Mets and Braves through 98 and 99, what a rivalry that was. Probably started even in 97 when the Mets started getting good. Again, under Bobby Valentine. Bobby Valentine and Bobby Cox couldn't stand each other. You know, uh, there was quite the rivalry. Uh, you had John Rocker putting down New York at that time. You know, uh, oh, it, it was yeah. Yeah, Chipper Jones just owned the Mets, you know, and, and he knew it. And he uh, you know, named his kid Shay. I mean, it just was, um, you know, it was a fun rivalry. You know, those te- I never remember those teams having a bench clearing brawl or anything like that, but they just didn't like each other. <clears throat> and so to see them at the beginning of that game, uh, after the Star Spangled Banner uh, was sung and um, them coming in and, uh, and and all hugging each other, starting with Valentine and Cox. You got goosebumps right there. Then it's a really good game. It's two to one, eighth inning. And, and again, is the game meaningful for the Mets? Not really. Um, but then Mike Piazza is up with a man on. And I, I just felt like something special was going to happen. In no way, shape, or form, I thought he was going to hit a home run over the camera tower. Uh, probably a good 420, 430 feet. But in Mike Piazza, dramatic fashion, he does it. I mean, I, I, don't, I still don't remember that long of an applause after a regular season home run than what Mike Piazza got. People were crying. I came close to crying. I remember it, it was just one of those moments that just etched in time. I remember sitting on the couch and and I remember mommy was sitting next to me and she fell asleep. And so I'm the only one just like, I don't believe it. You know, I really didn't believe that he hit that home run. It just meant so much for the city. So um, Mike Piazza's home run against the Braves. I should have looked up the exact date. I think it was the Friday after 9-11. So uh, maybe the 18th, 19th, somewhere around in there. Um, it just, uh, it, it was just a moment, uh, not only for baseball, but for the city. So that's my number three, all-time sports moment. What you got? Uh, is this the one? Um, I was trying to find the date for you. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So for me, I um, uh, it does look like, it's like I have it here, but I don't see the date. Twenty first, September twenty first. Okay. So like ten days later. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for me, um, also a very so I've been in different cities when teams have won titles. Yeah. Um, obviously very fun being in New York when 2000 world series, Mets, Yankees, um, all of the, the giant super bowls, the Knicks though, that's the joke. Um, but like, <laughs> there's a lot of exciting times when yes. like living in New York, I was up in Boston when the Patriots won the Super Bowl there. I was actually in living room with like a whole bunch of Patriot fans. Um, very funny watching. Was it Travis Kels? No. Whoever that was that had that like crazy catch, the tight end, and oh. all of them went dead silent. Yeah, but yeah, um, yeah. But really, like I look at being in Cleveland for the 2016 NBA Finals. <laughs> that has to be game seven, my number three moment. Um, just the whole 
that last few minutes of the excitement of the chase down by LeBron James, the three pointer by Kyrie Irving to put them on top for good. Um, just an amazing sequence of events. The fact that they beat a 73 and nine team, the fact that they came back three, one, the first team ever in NBA history to do that. Um, just so incredible. And then the celebration afterwards, like Cleveland proper has about 400,000 people. Um, there was like, I think like 1.5 million people downtown for the, the Cavs parade 52 years since they had last won any type of championship. So it wow. was just a lot of fun. It was like one of those days where like everyone was in a good mood because the Cavs just won the, the title. And um, like, I remember like people going crazy, like blasting. We are the champions down streets, honking yeah. horns. Like it was incredible. Yeah. Still my favorite championship that I've got to witness. Wow. Wow. What a moment. Yeah. And you, you had to, whether you had a tie to Cleveland or not, you just had to feel good for them. Was it the Browns was the last title, the NFL title was before the merger, right? Jim yeah. Brown, I think 64, his last year, maybe. Um, it's, it, it was amazing. I remember those finals very, very well. And I remember watching that game seven, staying up late and still you know late for me and still watching it because I just couldn't turn it off. I just felt like something special was, was going to happen uh, since the cap. I mean, nobody thought that the Cavs would push that to a game seven anyway, you know, because it was three games to one and um, just, uh, just amazing. Amazing. It's Kyrie's shining moment, right? <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> All right. Ken, we'll wrap it up there and take us home, man. All right. This is Kenny squared N. Kenny. With Sports on the Positive Tip, we will see you guys next week. Yeah, special guest next week. We'll talk a lot of Braves. We'll get a viewpoint south of the country. We'll talk a lot of Mets Braves with Mr. Mike Clark next week. We'll see you later.